together in LaGrange, Illinois. Then they moved to Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Uh, I went to freshman year of high school in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Then I went to sophomore and junior year of high school in Mattoon, Illinois, because we moved there. And then my senior year, I went to Lidditz High School in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. Uh, they left me behind there because I met Valerie. Uh, and from there, I think, and correct me guys if I'm wrong, but they, they moved to Tennessee, was it? And then from Tennessee to Georgia. And then from Georgia to Winton? Odin. Odin, Odin, Odin Illinois. And then from Odin, Illinois to Winton, where they, they lived right down the road uh, for almost 32, 33 years. Uh, so while many of you may think they've lived here forever, it's only late. <laughs> only the last 30 of 60 years that uh, they settled down in one place. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you. It was a great time of, of reflection to think about these three, uh, which I started to call the Merced Trio after some time. So I wrote some things down that I'd just like to read it, read it for you. Um, my dad was an equal balance of the prototypical company man and family man. He routinely went to the office on Saturdays and loved to talk about work. But he also brought recreational boats, swimming pools, horses, motorhomes, and country club memberships into our family at one time or another. And I especially remember uh, Sunday afternoons of golf that I played with him uh, when we were in Gallatin, and I was 15 or 16 back then. And it's, it's not hard for me to imagine, I'm as old as he was now then, it's not hard for me to imagine that that might have meant something to him as it turned out to mean to me. And even to this day, I use his putter when I play. And I might be able to do better with a newer one, but I still would rather use his. It helps me think of him uh, every day when I play. Then growing up with mom as our mother, uh, all of us kids were taught responsibility. To this day, I, I work before I play. I clean up after myself. I try to remember that if I don't have anything nice to say, it's just better not to say anything at all. <laughs> Uh, I try to go along with the flow, even if it matters just a little, but especially if it doesn't matter very much at all. All these things were mom, and I think they've made me a better person. Um, mom was sweet to everyone she met. Everybody liked mom. And, and to say that she was sweet to everyone she met, that means more when you realize that she was more comfortable alone than she was with people. She made an effort, and she always succeeded to make people feel comfortable. Um, the first time I saw a mom after died, dad died, uh, through her tears, she told me she, she knew that dad did the best she could for her. And I was able to tell her at the end that I think all the kids know she did the best she could for us, too. And then throughout my adult life, I was probably closest to Noreen than, than any of my siblings, really. And, and in large part, that was because she was always single and I married late. Um, and Growing up, uh, so I, I, I saw her, she was not a good speller, she hated math, uh, she was extremely shy, extremely sensitive, um, but she was very creative with art and writing, and uh, I'll never forget the day how happy she was when Dad brought a horse home, and one of my favorite pictures of Noreen is her standing next to the horse, the head over her shoulder, and she's just beaming. And then I saw her grow up to be a strong, resolute, determined fighter, uh, all the way to the end. Um, and by the end of her life, I never doubted anything that she couldn't confront and, and overcome. And uh, she taught me a, life, a lot about her uh, things, and even in her death, about courage and grace. I remember the doctor, the family doctor, telling her that there was nothing more to do with treating her cancer. and enjoy life more, but I, I, in contrast, worry that she didn't have enough fun. And I thought there'd be a day where I could maybe change that for her. I thought perhaps this day, when, when we were memorializing mom and dad, that this could be a new opportunity for Noreen. 
and I'm sorry that it's not. Um, she was told by her doctors, and she grew fond of repeating it in many contexts, that she was not textbook. And uh, she lived her life the way she wanted to, and didn't worry so much about what others wanted her to do. And so for all that, we're all blessed to, to have known her. went to that school too. So we uh, had a real common, and um, my sister and Peggy always would do things together. They were only a year apart. And uh, Albert held true to little marrying the girl almost next door. She was two doors away from us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had their wedding, everything, and my sister was in with them. And we just had so many growing up things together, playing kick the can in the alley and back in those days. And <laughs> we just uh, had good, solid growing up. And then finally, we, Al got married, and then my sister got married, and well, and then finally I did at the end, but with so many years in between them, I mean, I had five and nine years between So, but I'm glad I could come today and give them a thank you for being a big brother, cousin, and wife. <laughs> I would like to share with you a couple of thoughts that I have and things that I received from my dad, my mom, and my sister. One of the things my mom and my dad taught me was what it means to be committed to one another and to love one another through difficult times and good. And I watched them for many, many years while I was at home and even after I left home. I saw them go through some very difficult struggles, but never was there ever any question in my mind whether they were committed to one another and that they loved one another. And that was an example to me of something that I will treasure for all of my life. Dad gave me a couple of things. He always started, I remember he always started his day off with a cup of coffee. He was never very far away from the coffee pot. And uh, he loved sunny side up eggs. And uh, I remember that about him growing up as a kid and even today, for me, I, I cannot start my day without coffee, and I love sunny side up eggs, and I blame him for it. <laughs> my cholesterol is fine, but I do, I do, I do love my. In fact, I complained this morning because I asked for three at the Waffle House, and they only gave me two. They made a mistake, but, <laughs> but, I, but I do like my eggs. Um, Dad's work ethic, work ethic was a, a very impressive thing to behold. Um, I cannot remember, I don't know about you guys in, in, the, in, the, in the years after I left home, but I cannot ever remember seeing my dad idle. I mean, always. He was thinking, he was, he was working, he was, he was planning something. Toward the end of his life, when he started to show signs of dementia, which eventually took him, uh, we had the occasion to spend the entire day together at the house while the girls were off shopping at the coast. And I discovered, learned then, that I think before anybody else, Dad knew that things were slipping. Because in the course of the day, at the end of the day, we were sitting at the kitchen table. There was carrot cake on top of the microwave. And I remember I pulled the carrot cake down and we started eating the carrot cake. And he said to me, he said, Tim, he said, when I'm gone, he says, who's going to take care of my girls? And he was talking about Mom and Mommy. And so we talked about that. This was the first I really realized, I think, that Dad was really slipping. When I'm gone, he said, who's going to take care of my girls? And what he ended up doing was getting a promise from me that I would make sure that they were cared for. And he was content with that. It wasn't always easy uh, living in Iowa, but I tried to keep that promise, and I'd like to think that he would be pleased with me today in the way that we have, with my brother's help, and with Maureen's help, took care of Mom, and then took care of things after they were both gone. No one looked after Noreen, okay? Let's be clear about that. Uh, you, you did not look after Noreen. Uh, she was quite a challenge. She was stubborn, yes, she was independent, 
she was determined. She was a fighter. And basically what I ended up doing with Noreen was I would listen and I would encourage and we would pray together and I would offer my opinion and then she did with it what she wanted. But she had a good head on her and she, she, she made very good decisions. Yet there were many tender moments over the years. Phone calls, some emails, dial-up modems are not conducive to a lot of time on the computer, i got to tell you. And that's what they had out there. And then there were face-to-face -face conversations that I think were rather profound as we talked about faith, as we talked about God, as we talked about applying biblical truth in your life. I'll remember Noreen for the devotion that she had to serving people. Noreen is one of the few people in my life who I know, who, whether it was her employment or her, her, her ministry, her caring for mom and dad, she was an example and an inspiration, a model of what it meant to sacrifice your own personal ambitions and goals and aspirations in order to selflessly serve others. And that's what Maureen did, in my estimation, for most of her life. And there were many times when I was thankful that she was here with her stubbornness and her determinations because that stubbornness and that determination helped her through many, many difficult situations and made it easier for the rest of the family. Mom. Mom was a shy person, as has already been mentioned, and she gave that to me. I'm a shy person. Uh, people have a hard time believing that, but I tell them that it's true. I hate crowds. I hate crowds. Uh, I don't like talking on the phone, and neither did she. And I'd much rather spend an evening at home alone rather than out doing something, painting the town. Uh, I have to work at it, and I rely on the Lord's help in order to do it, and so did Mom. I bought a computer for Mom and Noreen, and Mom made an effort to use it, but she was intimidated by the fact that someone was telling her, you've got mail. <laughs> uh, she was convinced that somebody was sitting somewhere watching every keystroke that she made and telling her when she made an error and when she sent mail. I remember riding with the car in her, with her one time when GPSs were rather new and the, and the woman's voice on the GPS was saying, you know, in a half a mile, turn right. And she turned to me and she said, where is that lady sitting where she can watch you and tell you where you're <laughs> structured the whole thing, okay? And he kind of held everything together. And and there was uh, Peggy's pink and Noreen's purple or violet or whatever she, we argued about what color that really was, but in her artistic mode she would do this. And, and this was what happened when they came to California. And, and I want you to know that Noreen told me many times that it was her intention when she came with the family, having had her degree in art and, and then thinking about should she go to California, she got this, this semi-arrogant idea that she must pass all of their stuff before you can teach in the system. I know because I was an administrator in California for a long, long time. And so we have our little bar and everybody's got to live up to it. And she said she made a conscious decision that it would be best for mom and dad in taking care of them if she didn't go off and pursue those things. But rather, she would just look for what she could find and what she could get to give her the maximum amount of time and flexibility. She looked at me once and she said, because that's my job, to take care of mom and dad. And, and, and that's how she saw it. And uh, those of you who tried to dissuade her of something would know, no, that was her job. And uh, yeah, she, she could be very, very. And so, so uh, Maureen, to the, to the very end, the very last day of her life, was asking about mom. She told me that when dad was in a rest home, and she would visit with him and, and talk with him. She kept thinking, well, when he's gone, I, I'm going to have to take care of him. 
she, she felt the weight of that. She just kind of thought that way. And it wasn't that any of the rest of the family didn't care and didn't want to. It's just that she had, she had kind of put those boots on and she was going to walk through life that way. Well, God, well, fit to take the basket. And that just kind of created a real situation. And the situation was all of this. I want to say, not to be long, but I want to say two things about Noreen and Peggy that I think are important for us to know. I took Noreen to Fresno to the hospital when the doctor told her, you need to go down to Fresno to do some tests. I was there with her right after they come in and said, you're not going home today. And she looked at me and she said, but I want to go home. And uh, I said, the doctor said, you're going to, well, what does my doctor want to say? And I said, that's why we're here. <laughs> but, but what about mom? tell you this. I drove you here and I will not drive you. <laughs> I said, and, and the reason was, it was obvious to me by looking at her, at her and watching her over the last, that the year previous to that, that something was very wrong. And I looked at her and I said, and you're going to stay here and you're going to take the test and we're going to get the information and your doctor's going to tell you what's going to happen next. And I said, Noreen, I don't know why things like this are brought into our lives. There's, there's no real good answer for that, humanly speaking, on this earth. But I do know that the Lord who loves you will loves your mom and is going to make sure that everything's taken care of and I will go back and make sure everything's okay with her. So after a while, she finally looked at me and just simply said, well, okay, if it has to be that way. And I said, it does have to be that way, Marie. It does. And that began her journey. And it was a journey of never giving up. And her reason was, if she were too sick to take care of mom, and she knew mom would never leave her dogs, and her cats, and her home, she knew that, and she feared for her. 